good to be here with you all and to fellowship with you and to sing songs of praise and to consider our reliance upon the Lord. I need thee every hour as we sing, you know. I hope that you, you live in that constant need of, of the Lord and not in self-dependence or independence, but rather dependence completely upon the Lord. Before we begin, let's ask for the Lord's blessing and as we look into his word. Let's pray. Father, we ask that as we consider your word now, that you would open it up to us. Not only that we might understand the words that you have given us for us to know and the principles of truth that we can glean from them, but also how best that we should apply it in our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be considerate of, of the way we walk before you. And that you would help us to understand whether there are things that we need to change. Those things that we need to yield. Those things that we need to confess and repent of. I pray, Father God, that your word would cut to our hearts that we might follow you circumspectly for your pleasure and for your glory. Thank you, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. With today being the Comrades Marathon, I thought it would be a good thing to consider a portion of Scripture that draws upon the nature of athletic competition for the purpose of instructing us and godly conduct. <coughs> Immediately, the, the passage that I thought of was, was 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. And if I was to ask you to pick a passage of Scripture that, that uses an illustration of athletic competition, this is probably what you would think of. It's that well known. And I encourage you to turn with me in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I want to read verse 24 through 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. <coughs> know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. I really appreciate the achievement of completing the Comrades Marathon. It is an extremely difficult race, which is immensely taxing upon the body, which I think everybody who's run it today is going to feel tomorrow and perhaps the next day. This is not something that just anybody can do. It requires an enormous amount of dedication, training, and planning all year round in order to run a good race. As I said, not everyone is able to accomplish this feat, not because it is beyond their ability or capability, though there are some cases where that is the case, but rather because they do not possess the discipline or willingness to sacrifice what is needed in order to accomplish it. To complete the Comrades Marathon, one needs to train consistently in all conditions in order to run the race, not, not to mention win it. I mean, the, the guy that won it, my wife was telling me, won it today in what, five, five hours, 30, 30 something minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, second time he won it. Yeah, second time. The last time he got a silver, this time he, he won it, you know. To win it, one must actually possess an even greater dedication and sacrifice than the one who just aims to complete it. Recently, 
I have been consciously undertaking to curb my appetites. A couple months back, I weighed myself, <laughs> and I'd never seen those numbers. <laughs> I hadn't weighed myself in a couple of years, and I found myself to be the heaviest I had ever been. My weight was out of control and unhealthy, and it was due to my carefree attitude to the whims of my appetites. I would have little regard or restraint in what I ate and would dismiss the need for consistent exercise. Consequently, I think you all have witnessed over the last couple of years a growing of my stature. <laughs> you know, a lot of times I've heard it's a dad bod, you know, <laughs> but as I saw on a t shirt once, I prefer father figure. <laughs> but in mid-July, around the 12th of July, I decided that I would no longer do this. I would no longer have a carefree attitude to what, what I ate. And I wouldn't just not exercise. I decided that, that things were going to change. And I denied myself sweets and chocolate and sugary drinks and cappuccinos and hot chocolates and chips and fast food, high cal caloric snacks in favor of a good diet and consistent exercise. And I know what you're thinking. You're looking at me and going, mm. you know, <laughs> you know, drop in the ocean. But I have lost five kgs so far since the 12th well, of July, well done. you know, and I know that I have a long way still to go. But I say all of this. To say that I've come to realize two things through this process. One is that I was a slave to my appetites. When I felt like something sweet, I ate something sweet. If I felt like a hot chocolate, I ate a hot chocolate. If I saw a Krispy Kreme donut at a good price, I'd have a Krispy Kreme. You know? I was a slave to my appetites. And the second thing I, I learned was that there is a value to self-control. It's not that it was beyond my ability, it was just that I didn't want to. But I had to say no. Temperance or self-control is essential to our lives. But it is our love of fulfilling our appetites that present, prevents us from possessing temperance. Yet if we do not possess self-control and are carried away by our appetites, whatever they may be, we will be destroyed by them. This is true both physically and spiritually. This process of physical self-control has prompted me to consider my spiritual walk too. And to consider where I've been a slave to my appetites and desires and have not exercised self-control in following and serving Christ. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, and it's something that we all as believers ought to possess. Let's have a look at some verses. Turn with me to Galatians. We know Galatians. Galatians 5. Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. What? Temperance. Against such there is no law. Temperance there, self-control, is one of the, the outworkings of the Spirit of God. Which means that as believers in Christ, as we seek to follow the Lord, what should we see in our lives in an ever greater measure? Self-control. That is... The purposeful denying of our sinful desires and appetites in favor of God's will. Numerous scriptures call for us to be temperate in our Christian walk. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. It doesn't use the word temperance here, but temperance is most definitely in line. Self-control is most definitely 
under consideration. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, prepare them for action, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We are to prepare our minds and our minds are to be sober, prepared for action, requires self-control. Turn over to Second Peter, chapter 1. And look what we see here. Let me back up to verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience Godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity or love. There needs to be self-controlled coupled with, with knowledge. Sin pursues and thrives in excess and indulgence against the will of God. When we consider the way the scriptures describe the outworking of the sinful nature, we find re references all over the place to sinful abandon and excesses. And, and we're prone to all of this. Did God give us food to enjoy? I mean, you think about it. God could have given us something that all tasted the same, but had all the necessary nutrients for our sustenance. You know? Yeah, maybe like manna, okay? Where it was just one thing, you know, and that's that's the only flavor that you got. And you can go your whole life being perfectly sustained with just one flavor. How do you think you'll handle? You think so? There's, if you didn't know any alternative, but what would it do is that you would eat out of necessity, not not to enjoy, and yet. Consider, he made different types of fruit. Can you describe to me what a peach tastes like? Yummy. <laughs> okay, that's not a way. <laughs> Yummy isn't, you know. But can you describe the flavor? I cannot. No. Cannot. No. Or banana? No. Or pineapple? No. You know, what you find is that it's such a unique flavor. That there's nothing else like it. If you want to know what a peach tastes like, you have to have a peach. You have to know what a, a pear tastes like, you know. And the same goes for all kinds of, of foods and herbs, rosemary, thyme, you know. All of these are unique. And he's given them all for us so that we might be able to mix and match and create wonderful uh, flavors and combinations where we'll use lemon with sweet in order to balance. Sorry, must I stop it? I, you know, <laughs> you know? My, my point is, is that God has given us something to enjoy. You know what the sinful nature does, though? It takes that which it enjoys and then seeks to go to excess. And you have gluttony, a lack of self-control. You know, like I've, I've testified to you this evening that, you know, there were, if I was, you know, I think the recommended serving of an Oreo biscuit is two biscuits. I eat the, I ate them by the sleeve, you know, <laughs> you know, excess. That's not what God intended. But we see that within everything within man, that which was meant for our good, we then pervert. And take it to excess and to extreme. <coughs> Sex was supposed to be something that is good between a husband and his wife. And yet the world has taken that outside of that boundary to excess and perversion and abomination. Sin is filled with all of these things. 
You know, there's so many that, that speak. Turn with me to, back to Galatians. Back to Galatians 5 as we look at the outworkings of the sinful nature. Galatians 5. Nineteen. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, that is, you know, sexual immorality, uh, you know, indulging in it, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Go over one, a couple of pages to Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse 17 through 19. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given them Selves over unto lasciviousness, sexual corruption, to work all uncleanness with what? Greediness. Greediness. The sense of that word is a continual lust for more. Mm. I will continue to engage and I will continue to have more and more, never being satisfied. Another one. First Peter chapter 4. I know I'm making you bounce a little bit, but First Peter chapter 4, look at verse 3 through 6. I actually love this portion of Scripture. <clears throat> For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. In our past life, we followed the world. When we walked in lasciviousness, Lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Doesn't that describe the world? You know, excess, parties, drunkenness, other sins. Verse 4. Wherein, now, they think it strange that you run not with them. To the same excess of riot or wastefulness, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him who is ready, that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. I love it. I love that that is what we were. Now they think it's strange that we don't engage in the same excesses anymore. Judged of men, but alive to God. Last, Titus. Where Dickie read for us this morning, this evening. You know what I mean. <laughs> 11 through 14. <clears throat> For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Doing what? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, before salvation, our life was worldly excess. After salvation, however, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. No longer should the appetites of our flesh be allowed to run rampant, but rather be brought under control and denied. This is the outworking of God's grace in our lives. God's grace, which brings salvation, leads us to deny, according to this verse, you know, it teaches us to denying. 
the sinful lusts. To live righteously, soberly and godly in this present world. The grace that we have received requires us to say no. To say no to ungodly desires. And those things that would hinder us from living as we ought. We are to live right, looking forward to the appearing of Jesus Christ. With this in mind, let us go back to that portion of Scripture that I wish to be our focus. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24 through 27. Now I have little doubt that many of you know this portion of Scripture. Am I right? <clears throat> Running the race. Or you've heard it referenced in some message or sermon or something to some extent. And so I realize that you've probably heard sermons already on it. And that you know it quite well. But what you may not be aware of is its context. Because a lot of times we know these verses but we don't know the discourse in which they fit. Know this context? What is it about? When he starts to know ye, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye might, may obtain. What is the context here? What is he talking about? These few verses of illustration fit within a much longer, larger discourse. It actually begins in chapter 8 and verse 1. That's where it begins. And I want you to see what it is about. What is Paul addressing? Chapter 8 and verse 1. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. The focus is... The question surrounding, should I eat food? Should believers eat food that has been offered to an idol? Okay? And that is the context of chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, all the way up to chapter 11 and verse 1, where we then see that he ends this discourse by saying, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And notice in verse 2, the first word there is, now I praise you. What was the first word in chapter 8 and verse 1? Now, concerning this, here he changes subject. So, from chapter 8 verse 1 through to chapter 11 verse 1, Paul is dealing with one issue. And that is the eating of food that has been sacrificed to idols or offered to idols. As you no doubt aware, the Gentiles were heavily steeped in Greek and Roman idolatry during the establishment of the early church. The entire culture and society revolved around religious festivals, offerings, and rituals. It was part of their everyday life. And this was a huge problem to new believers, who now found themselves living in a culture that was so heavily steeped in idolatry and its religious practices. Idolatry was thus something that Paul had no doubt already instructed the Corinthian church on. In fact, we know this to be the case because we know what happened at the council in Jerusalem in Acts 15. After they were discussing, what, what do we do with the Gentiles now that they've come to know Christ? What do we do with them? Should they be brought under the law? And after the council, the, it was concluded by the apostles that they are not to be brought under the law. But they did leave them with some instruction. And that instruction was this, in verse 20 of Acts chapter 15. You don't have to turn there for time's sake, but you can check me out later. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols. And from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. That involved diet. It involved, involved food. 
So the instruction concerning idolatry was clear. Keep yourself, abstain from idolatrous practices. Abstain from the pollution of idols. Now this was a difficult thing in these churches due to the cultural norms in which they lived. It appears that the response of some, if not more, were based on the knowledge that idols are not entities. Okay? In other words, an idol is just something made out of wood or stone or porcelain or gold or silver or something of that, that nature. That there are no other gods and that is just an object. And thus, food is food. Whether it's been offered to this idol, you know, that is nothing. We know that there is only one God. And somebody's essentially offering their food to a piece of rock. <laughs> that doesn't defile the, rock, the, the food. Just because they've offered it to a rock. You know what I'm saying? This was the knowledge with which they, they had. And so... It was coming back saying, we can eat. In fact, you can see this in chapter 8. This is, this is what we see going through here. You know, look at verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be uh, that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there be gods many and lords many. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. You know, so food is food. And so this is what the practice was. This was what the Corinthian church was engaging in. And Paul now is writing to address this issue. Is it okay just to eat food? That has been offered to idols. And he tackles the subject using three scenarios that they would have regularly encountered. First scenario, eating food sacrificed to an idol at the temple of a false god. Okay. The second scenario is eating food of unknown history bought and acquired from the market. Okay. Because if you're going to buy uh, any kind of food from the market, it's very likely that it has already been offered to a, a false god and then brought to the market to be sold. Okay? So what do you do in that situation? And the third scenario is you've been invited to the house of an unbeliever. What do you do about eating their food? Which is also likely, because they're an unbeliever, been offered to a normal. And so he tackles it, and there are a few principles that govern his instruction to them on this matter. And the first, first principle that governs his entire instruction on the matter is this. The salvation and edification of others must be your principal concern. The salvation and edification of others must be your principal concern. In fact, it's how he starts in verse 1. Look at verse 1. He says there at the end of verse 1, Knowledge puffeth up, but charity or love edifies. He's already establishing... See, they were making an argument from knowledge. We know that this is just a piece of rock. But he says, knowledge puffs up. Love seeks to edify. And he then goes on to explain how a weak brother who does not possess your same knowledge could see you eating at the temple food that has been offered to idols and you, by insisting on your liberties that that's okay, cause them to stumble and get swept into idolatry. And he says, no, you should deny your rights in order to save them and to edify them. Your principal concern is not your rights and your liberties, 
But them, we live in a society that insists on their rights, eh? I'm allowed to do this. The Bible never says that I can't do this. And I'm going to do what I like. Ah, but is it edifying? Does it further the gospel? Does it build up your brother and sister in Christ? And you see, we see this argument, you see in verse 11. Have a look at uh, chapter 8, verse 11. And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? You can see, he's, he's emphasizing the salvation and edification of others needs to be your principal concern. Look at chapter 9 and verse 23. Because he then starts talking about the fact that he has rights. And this is also a very well-known portion of Scripture where he says, I've become all things to all men that I by all means might save some. To the Gentile I become as a Gentile, to the Jew I become as a Jew. What is he talking about? <laughs> he's not saying that, oh, I, I engage and do what they do. No, 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 no. What he's saying is that I'm prepared to sacrifice my liberties and rights that are due me, so that the gospel can be furthered to those individuals. So in chapter 9 and verse 23, he says there after he has said to those that are without the law, as without the law. To those that are with, with the law, you know, uh, in verse 20, he says those that are under the law. I mean, he didn't have to observe the Jewish law. But if he was ministering to Jews... He would bring himself under the law. He would sacrifice his liberty rather than insisting by knowledge that I can do what I like. No, I restrain myself, my rights and my privileges for the gospel's sake. In verse 23, he says, this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Look at chapter 10 and verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. Just because I can do it, doesn't mean I should. Not everything is profitable. And then he goes, all things are lawful unto me, but all things edify not. See, what is my principal concern? The profit of others, the edifying and the furthering of the gospel. Verse 33. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. And then he says, be ye followers with me. So the first principle that governs his entire instruction on this matter is the salvation and edification of others must be your principal concern. The second thing is, God's glory must be your goal in whatever you do. We see in chapter 10 there, and verse 11, chapter 10, or maybe, yeah, he's talking, I mean, again, he talks about the example of Israel being cut off and destroyed in the wilderness. He says, these are, are examples, you know, this happened unto them for ensamples. That they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. We are to be warned by God's judgment of them. Look at verse 22. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? In other words, this principle is, is that in everything that you do, you are to glorify God. He ends that in verse 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So you see, there's two things that are governing his instruction around idolatrous food. Okay? Not idolatrous food, but food offered to idols. Okay? Namely, is it profitable for others and for the furtherance of the gospel? And two, is God glorified? And if you're participating in these feasts, God is not glorified and you'll come under judgment. And you can cause your brother to stumble. Both of these principles actually underlie the scripture that we're looking at in 1 Corinthians 9. This portion, 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27, is a transition. 
between his argument that he has just made, that I suspend and restrict and restrain my rights in order to proclaim the gospel so that people might be saved, for the gospel's sake, I restrain and limit myself. So that's the first part of that argument that this is now talking about when he uses this analogy of an athlete who now shows self-control in order to achieve a goal. But then he transitions into what follows, which he says, Israel engaged in sinful indulgence and their bodies littered the desert. Why? Because God judged them. Because he is a jealous God. And he will not give his glory to another. And he will not permit <clears throat> sinful behavior. And so in chapter 10, we see Paul is warning them of God's jealousy and judgment. Because of Israel's lack of self-control. And he gives it to them as a warning. They had the attitude that I can eat. No questions asked. He says, well, that's not the end of the matter. Are you causing your brother to stumble? And are you preventing or causing a stumbling block to the gospel? And if you are, you should exercise self-control and restraint and deny that liberty. And secondly, their idea is that I can participate in this idolatrous feast. That involves the worship of demons. And God works. There is no fellowship between God's people and the worship of demons. And you're going to get yourself into trouble. And those are the two key arguments of Paul. And this portion of 24 through 27 is sandwiched right between them. Transitioning between. Now, just in case you are wondering, Paul makes the following recommendations regarding food offered to idols. One, you should not participate or partake of food offered to idols within the temples or as part of their religious festivals. <coughs> For it will cause your weaker brother to stumble and to sin. And because there can be no fellowship between the Lord and the worship of demons. That's the first. So don't participate in the idolatrous feast. In other words, you shouldn't participate in Diwali. Or Eid. Or anything else. That is of a false god. Two. If you purchase food from the market which may or may not have been previously offered to idols, eat asking no question of conscience. Okay? There's no question there. That's kind of like us going to Kentucky Fried Chicken, you know, or, or buying rainbow chicken, and we're not asking questions as to whether or not it's halal or not. If it's been prayed over to Allah or not. Doesn't matter. Okay? Ask no question of conscience. Okay? It's just food. Three. If a believer invites you to a feast, eat what is offered to you without asking questions. But if someone at that feast says, hey, that was sacrificed to idols, did you know that? Then don't eat it anymore. For your brother's sake. And so those are the guidelines that he uses, but it's based upon those two principles. Whatever you do, do for the glory of God. And two, the salvation and edification of your brother ought to be your principal concern. And really, that needs to be our attitude, all of us. And the way in which we relate to one another. Our principal concern is not our own rights, you know, and privileges. But rather asking the question, while this may be permissible, is it profitable? While it may be permissible, is it edifying? And if ever the answer to those, those two questions is no, then you shouldn't do it. You should exercise self-control self -control or self-restraint and deny that for the benefit of your brother. See, knowledge puffeth up. Isn't that what we tend to do? 
I'll prove to you what I can do. I can do it. Love edifies. <clears throat> Knowledge puffeth up. Love edifies. And so it's within this context that we see this call for self-control. Now, I've run out of time. So that's a fantastic introduction. Sorry. <laughs> Kidding, I don't know. That's for you to judge. <clears throat> But we haven't got to the actual passage here. But I, so I want to encourage you, I want to give you some homework then. Okay? And don't, don't dismiss this homework. Okay? Don't scorn it. I want you to exercise self-control. And make sure that you do it. Okay? I'd like you to read through... 24 through 27. In fact, I'd like you to read that whole section. Chapter 8, verse 1, through to chapter 11, verse 1. Understand his argument. Understand how all the pieces fit together in that argument. And then have a look with new eyes as to what he is saying in verses 24 through 27. Because he uses the idea of an athlete. An athlete what does an athlete need in order to compete and win? Well, I'll just show you this in verse 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery or the ability to compete is what? Temperate, Temperate in all things. I would like you to see, I'll tell you what I've done. I've drawn out three things out of this portion, verses 24 through 27, that I wish to share with you. Three key things out of this. I want you to do the same. Okay? I want you to go through verse 24 through 27, and I would like you to seek to understand that and draw out three things that Paul is saying here that is important for you to then apply to your life. Okay? All right. So we'll continue this next time. So where do I leave you here with this? Well, in the nature of my introduction, let me then leave you with something that I had not initially embarked on, on giving you as, a, as something to consider. But that principle, those two principles that mark his entire discussion here, let those two principles be saying that you think about this week too. Other things, look at how you live in your life. Look at the things you engage in. Look at your entertainment. Look at your, 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 your work. Look at your activities. Look at, at how you spend your time. Is it for God's glory? Because that ought to be your goal. And the way in which you engage yourself, look at your entire conduct in life. Like, I would like you to do what I did halfway through July with regards to my physical condition. I'd like you to have a good look at your spiritual condition. What is my conduct like? How am I living? Do I have self-control? Or am I just haphazardly going according to my appetites? Is it for God's glory, the things that I do, and the things that I do, is the salvation and edification of others my principal concern? Sadly, as Paul states here, that he has done, he makes himself all things to all men, that by all means he might save some. How many Christians do you know have that attitude? Why? Why not? Is it the same instruction that Christ gave Paul, the same instruction given to us? Exactly the same. Why is it that Paul had such 
a diligence and dedication. And why do Christians not have today? Consider it. Consider your life in relation to that. Because Paul sets himself as an example here for the Corinthian believers. He ends this section by saying, Be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. Consider his example as you go through this portion of Scripture this morning. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to reflect upon these, these portions of Scripture and these issues that were being dealt with in the, in the Corinthian church. Please, please help us to look at our own lives and I ask that you would give us clarity of those areas in our lives that we need to change. That we would seek to glorify you. That the edification of our brother and sister in Christ would be of our utmost concern. That the salvation of the lost would be also of our utmost concern. And that these concerns and principles would dictate the way in which we live. That we would not live insisting upon our rights and privileges, but considering what is profitable to those around us. Thank you, Lord, for your word and for your truth. In Jesus' name I pray.